Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to thank everyone for coming out this morning. A little cooler today. Uh, and I want to thank all those that gather and join us online faithfully every week. Before we get started, there is one announcement that I do want to make. It's been in the bulletin, and, and it's also been on our email, the flock note that we sent out the last couple of weeks. Uh, there is a, uh, an old-fashioned gospel singing this afternoon, and it's going to be at the Mennonite Church that is out in Perkeomanville. They're, you're going to be meeting in what was their old meeting uh, house from 1847, uh, which I think would be really, really cool. Uh, they talked about uh, having uh, inviting for us to come out there to be with them. I know Mark really got into the spirit of things, if you haven't seen it. He even shaved his beard in the Mennonite fashion so that he would be prepared to go out there to be with us today. So I hope that you can join us. We have, uh, um, I, I want us to be mindful as we begin this morning. Our brother Joe's not with us. He went back to Ohio to be with uh, his grandmother who fell and hurt her head. She is in the hospital. Uh, so hmm? she has come home. Praise God for that. We want to be mindful as Joe makes that trip there and back. And we have a, a new member in attendance this morning, I saw. And I've lost track of where she went. Right up front. And she is beautiful, all wrapped up in her little pink blanket there. Can we give a big round of applause for Felicity first time here at our worship this morning. Yeah. Excited to have your little sister here? Yeah. Penelope's excited. I, I want to say that the message that I've prepared for today to share is not going to be an easy message for me to share. And it may very well not be a very easy message for you to hear. So I'm gonna ask that you pray with me as we start this morning. So God, I'm gonna ask that you give me boldness this morning and also give me clarity. And I pray that people will hear my heart and not just my words. And I pray, Father, that, that you would increase among all of us who name the name of Jesus a greater desire to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. For Jesus' sake, amen. Some years ago, there was a movie titled Invictus, and it, it told the story of Nelson Mandela, the new president of South Africa, making a conscious decision to, to try to unify the nation based on the means of the almost all-white national rugby team. But that's not the only statement he made. He chose to intentionally use the security personnel from former President de Klerk's security force. And this was a security force that had sometimes used some pretty oppressive means. I want to show you a clip this morning. And this is a clip where the head of security sees a letter that is signed by President uh, Mandela authorizing such an action. Please watch this with me. What is this? <coughs> Mr. Jason Chavalona. That's me. Am I under arrest? Captain Feder and team reporting for duty, sir. We've been assigned to this office. There are our orders. So just tell me stuff. You look agitated here, sir. Well, that's because there are four special branch cops in my office. They say they are the presidential bodyguards and they have all assigned my view. Ah, yes, ah, yes. Well, uh, these men are special trained by SAS. They have lots of experience. They are protected the clerk. Yes, sir, but it doesn't mean that they have to come You here. asked for more men, didn't you? Yes, sir, I asked them. Um, when people see me in public, they see my bodyguards. You represent me directly. The Rainbow Nation starts here. Reconciliation starts here. Reconciliation, sir. Yes, reconciliation, Jason. Comrade President, not long ago these guys tried to kill us. Maybe even these four guys in my office tried and often succeeded. Yes, I know. Forgiveness starts here, too. Forgiveness liberates the soul. It removes fear. That is why it is such a powerful weapon. Please, Jason. Try. In, 
It's very rare in the Bible for a long story like we witnessed last week to be repeated. But that's what Luke does in the book of Acts. So we're in a series called Unlimited where we're studying from Acts chapter 9 through 15 how the early church went from a local movement that only reached one race to a global movement that crossed racial and ethnic lines. And the turning point of this story is the Cornelius event. Last week we saw in chapter 10 uh, that the story of two conversions. There was the conversion of Cornelius, who was a, a decent and nobleman, who brought this conversion and it taught us that we too are saved, not because of our goodness, because of the goodness of God, who offers us in Christ Jesus the gift of forgiveness. But we also saw in chapter 10 the conversion of Peter. You remember, Philip lived in Caesarea. The goal was, if the goal was just to, to convert, uh, uh, to just to convert Cornelius, he could have sent him across the street. But he went 30 miles away to get Peter because God wanted to do a work on Peter at the same time he was doing a work through Peter. And Peter now realizes, I now realize that God does not show favoritism. And his conversion included the new realization of just how wide and how full is the unlimited reach of the gospel. But then in chapter 11, Luke turns around and he tells the story again. Because there's one more conversion that needs to take place. And that's the conversion of church that we're going to see today. So join in with me as we begin, starting in verse 1. We read, the apostles... And the believers throughout Judea, go ahead and change that slide, jo uh, Josiah. <clears throat> the apostles and the believers throughout jo Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of an uncircumcised man and you ate with them. Isn't it amazing how fast the grapevine works? Especially when the news is controversial. Peter goes and has one ham sandwich, and then the next day it's all over the internet. <laughs> he shows up in Jerusalem, and he gets criticized. They feel compelled to call Peter out because of what he's done. We're talking Peter here. We're talking Jesus' most intimate friend. We're talking about the man who preached the first gospel sermon. And the text doesn't say that the, the other apostles joined in to the criticism, but they couldn't stop it either. And that goes to show us what a huge deal this is. And side note, I need, to, I need to remind us of something. That we need to be grateful in the church for past men and women who had the courage to challenge tradition. Who had to, to question uh, assumptions and to risk their reputations to remove the limits of the mission of God. Can, I, can someone say amen? amen? Because we have been blessed in our history by men and women who were willing to put it all on the line for the mission in lieu of the tradition. And Peter did the same thing. He didn't respond with a rant, but with a history lesson. So he retells the story and you can read the first half of chapter 11 where it says it. And I want you to do, it makes it very clear, if you can notice there, that he, he states that he does not act on his own initiative. Because at least 10 times in the story, he says, and he gives credit to God. He says, hey, I, I'm not the one that gave uh, Cornelius a vision. The angel did that. God did that. I'm not the one that asked for a vision myself. I was just a hungry guy on top of a roof. And I'm taking a nap, and he gives me a vision three times. I'm not the one that sent the Holy Spirit to interrupt my sermon. God did that. And then they got baptized in the Holy Spirit right in front of all of us. And he doesn't make a point to mention the fact, you know, Cornelius is a good man. You know, you know, you know Gentiles. They're, they're all like that. But, but this one, he really is a good one. No, he doesn't say it that way. Because the issue is not the character of Cornelius. The issue that we're talking about here is the agenda of God. But I think the Jerusalem church already knew that. They already knew what God's agenda was. Because let me show you what Luke does a little later in chapter 11. 
He goes back in time and he talks about the time when Stephen was stoned. Look at verse 9 and we'll read it together. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed. Now this is going to be a number of years before Cornelius. But look what they did. They traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and they began to speak, speak to Greeks also. This had never happened before. It says that they were telling them about the good news of the Lord and the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. You see, Cornelius was not the first Gentile to be saved. That had already been happening. But the Cornelius controversy was not about salvation. It's about reconciliation. Look at verse 3 with me. They didn't say... When they heard that you had preached the gospel to the Gentile, they didn't say, we heard that, that you baptized a Gentile. No, they said, you entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them. You see, it's not about who can enter the baptistry here. We're talking about who can come to the table. That's what it was about. And as I reflected on the, the text this week, I was flooded with memories of my own childhood and the church that I grew up in. I was a boy, but I, and I didn't know that we were a sectarian church. I was just a boy, and I, I didn't know that we were a legalistic church. We were. I was a boy, and I knew that we were a racist church. Have you ever heard of World Bible School? It's another thing that I remember as a boy. My uncle uh, gave me the privilege of sharing, of blessing, of corresponding with men and women in Ghana in an attempt to study with them and allow them to, to learn the gospel. When, those information would, when that information would come back and some of those correspondence was coming back, I was allowed to put them on the bulletin board in the back of the church. The letters in the Bible class correspondences and those resulting pictures, yes, the baptisms, that came from them. Those went up on the bulletin board too. But I need to tell you about another story from that time in my life. We had a young man and he met a young woman. They began to share their testimonies with each other. She started coming to, to Bible class and, and he brought her to, to worship and we were at fellowship meals together. And, and they began to realize very quickly that it wasn't just their love that they had with Jesus Christ. They fell in love with each other. But when they got married, that church that I grew up in showed their true colors. They brought out every single misused, if I might say, scripture that you could possibly imagine. Because that couple that loved Jesus and loved each other ended up being divorced. Not for any other reason except that that young woman was black. You see, we were fine with the pictures on the bulletin board. We just weren't fine with them being in our house. And how do you explain that type of incongruity? It's because that we have accepted a false gospel, an inadequate gospel, a limited gospel that preaches salvation but stops short of reconciliation. It's a gospel that fails to see that the cross has both vertical and horizontal dimensions. That Jesus went to the cross. It wasn't just to make us right with God. It was to make us right with each other. And so the church in Jerusalem needed more conversion. And they needed to understand this, that the true discipleship means unlimited fellowship. That Jesus is not just building a church where anyone can enter the water. He's building a church where everyone can come to the table. Because the church is God's answer for what has been the world's greatest problem since the Tower of Bible. And that is our national and our racial hatred and our division. God's answer is a work that through Jesus, in people like us, who understand that the cross doesn't just go up, it goes out. It, Paul says in Ephesians, 
chapter 2, he said, For Christ has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the walls of hostility that separated us. Do you see, the cross is not just about salvation. It's about reconciliation. He continues and he read together. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God. By means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. Throughout the New Testament, this is called the mystery. This is what God was unveiling. This is what God was revealing. That he was doing a work through Jesus and through Jesus' people that the world had never seen before. That God was bringing this revolutionary thing, this radical thing. That God was bringing Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, together at well, one table, welcoming each other. Sometimes I hear Christians say, well, we just need to be a colorblind church. <laughs> no, that's not it. We need to be a colorful church. The church needs to welcome and celebrate our differences, our ethnicities and our heritages. This is what God's plan and will was. That's why in Revelation it says, every tongue and tribe is going to be gathered around the throne. That's why it says in Revelation that God is going to bring all nations and all cultures into his kingdom. Church is a place where our ethnic and our culture are differences. They aren't erased. They are embraced. And they are celebrated. And it's a beautiful thing when the church on earth is a preview of heaven. Can I get an amen? Shouldn't have to ask one for I'm that one, guys. I'm a little pumped up this morning, can you tell? Because we're going to talk about my favorite church in the New Testament. We're going to talk about the church at Antioch. Because this is the first church that ever crossed racial lines. The very first one. Look at what it says in verse 22. It says, news of this reached the Jerusalem church and they sent Barnabas. That's another super, superstar. He's one of my heroes. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw that the grace of God had been done. He was glad. And he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. I'll tell you a story about one minister told me. It's about how he found a directory from years past in the attic of his church. And on the back page of that directory, they had a list of all of the black, Negro, and Hispanic churches that were in the area. Because, you know, the church wanted to be magnanimous. Because if a person of color came to our church, we wanted to be able to tell them where they ought to go to church. You know, they didn't have two churches in Antioch listed in the yellow pages there. You can go back and check that for me. I'll tell you it's true. They had one church, but they saw that the cross was lifted up. And when that happened, lines of racial walls were torn down. And the community could not ignore what they were seeing because they had never seen such a thing before. You notice what it said in verse 20, 21. It said, a great number of people believe and turn to the Lord. And then again in a paragraph, just the next one over in verse 24, it says, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. They couldn't stop baptizing people in Antioch. They had a baptism weekend. They had so many people, and then they were stacking up again. So a month later, they had to have another one. They were, so many people were coming because the church was giving witness to the world of something that it had never seen before. Because the see the, the church in Antioch modeled the truth that tells us that people are one to Christ when we, his disciples, are one in Christ. We must not limit the gospel to personal salvation. Jesus' prayer for the unlimited reconciliation for everyone that calls himself their followers. If you knew you were dying tomorrow, what would you pray about? I bet you it would be pretty important, wouldn't it? Well, we know what Jesus prayed about the day he was gonna, before he was going to die. Look at John 20, uh, 17, verse 23. May they, his disciples, experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love me as much 
and love them as much as you love me. Jesus says the world will recognize his identity when they see our unity. And if we are going to wear his name, we cannot limit that prayer. I don't think it's a coincidence that the scripture says in verse 26, it was in Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. But I want to share another story with you of another preacher in his childhood memory of his bulletin board. It says, and so I remember standing in front of the bulletin board in my church with all of those pictures on the wall. You know the pictures I'm talking about. He had the same ones that I did. Said, and I stood next to a woman. She was a matriarch, a leading figure in our church. And I didn't have to wonder what she was thinking because she said it out loud. I wish they wouldn't put those pictures on the wall. I just don't like the idea. And she used the N-word of them being in heaven with me. And the preacher says, but I remember thinking to myself, lady, you got nothing to worry about. <laughs> He goes on further, he says, sometimes later I got to preach my first sermon. And it was terrible. It had six points, and the third point was racism is bad. It is sin, and I called it that. There was an emergency elders meeting that night, and I was informed a week later that I would no longer be allowed to preach in that church ever again. A few years later, the church where this preacher grew up and was baptized and preached his first sermon closed. And by the way, that church that I told you about that I grew up in, that I was baptized at, and that I preached my first sermon at, it closed as well. And some will say, well, I guess that everybody moved away or maybe the economy was bad. No, they closed because Jesus took their candlestick away. Because if you're not going to pursue his mission, Jesus says, you're not allowed to wear my name. It says they were called Christians first at Antioch. Now I fully expect, and we've heard amens this morning, and there's a lot of heads that are nodding. Because that always happens when you preach a sermon like this. But, but here's the problem. Most of us stop at the idea that, well, I'm not adding to the problem. Most of us have said, I'm not a racist because I don't use that word. And you're right. It's been years since I've had a conversation with one single person in the church that I thought was a blatant racist. But, but is that where Jesus set the bar? Just don't make it worse? Or does Jesus want us to go, as his followers, does he want us to start doing something better? To start making it better? Because when I look at what's going on in our nation right now, somebody needs to do something to make it better. And I think it should start with us. I'm going to give you three suggestions to take home with you. They're on your pass outs. That'll make things better. And I believe that they come directly from text. Here's the first one that we need to see. Is that we need to listen to somebody's story. Change began in Acts 10 and 11 because Peter listened to Cornelius' story. And because the church in Jerusalem listened to Peter's story, change happened. The problem today is we're not listening enough. We're not listening enough, and we're doing way too much scrolling. You know what I mean. And we're deciding on what our issues are going to be based on the latest fad in Twitter and Facebook. And by the way, you know that, that in Facebook and in these social platforms, you get cyber followed? They're going to notice what links you click on today, and they're going to make sure you get two more tomorrow so that they can continue to perpetuate what you've already decided that you believe in your heart. And that's why sitting at the table is so important. Look at this picture. You may have seen it before, but this is a picture taken some time ago where some football players from Florida State went to a local school, and one of the best players, their wide receiver, Travis Rudolph, was so avoided that he was sitting all by himself. So he went over there and sat by him. He didn't know that Bo Paschke usually sat by himself every day because Bo was, uh, had autism. And Travis went up and he befriended him. Someone took a picture of the, pic, uh, of, the, of the two of them, sent it to Bo's mom. Bo's mom put it on Facebook. It went viral. And Bo doesn't sit by himself anymore. 
He's one of the more popular kids in the school because powerful things happen at tables. Listen to this man's story. He's a black pastor, I want to tell you that. He says, my father was very active in the civil rights movement in 1960, and that has given me a certain bent of thought on these matters. But when I married a white woman a few years ago, I went to Thanksgiving dinner at her house, in the house of her family. They gathered around the table, and including a member of the family who was a police officer, who sat at the Thanksgiving meal with his bulletproof vest and uniform on because he had to go to duty right after he finished eating. And as he stood up to leave, his wife came up to him and kissed him and said, you make sure you come home to me. And the black pastor sat there and thought, you know, my wife kisses me goodbye every morning too. But she never wonders, will I come home? But in that one day, at that one table, he was given a new story and a new perspective. And for several years, I have been intentional. I have had many meals and many conversations, especially with African American pastors. And I've asked the question, tell me your story. What is it like for you to be a, a black man or a black woman in a culture who wants to follow Jesus? And if I told you some of the stories, it would break your heart and you cry. Because you see, when we say, tell me more, it's a good place to start. Because the Bible says that we need to carry each other's burdens. And one way you carry each other's burdens is you listen to it and you legitimize it. Instead of saying, well, it's not that way anymore. You just need to get over it. If you listen to the story and you own it, things be different. And I'm just asking as a follower of Jesus, whose story do you need to hear? And will you decide in advance, if you listen to someone's story, that you will listen non-defensively? And instead, I want to suggest that you lead with grace instead of judgment. Go ahead and switch that slide. I'm glad Barnabas went to the first church that crossed racial lines. He was a good man. Because this church in Antioch could have split if Barnabas had showed up with a perspective limited on bias and tradition. But he didn't arrive with his mind made up because the Bible clearly says that he came and he saw the evidence of the grace of God. He came to a church and he was looking for what was right, not for what was wrong. How would it look if we started looking at people different? From, from us, uh, for what God is doing among them versus things that we think that God has done wrong in them or they've done wrong themselves. I thought former President Bush's statement put it brilliantly at the Memorial Day or at the Memorial for the police officers in Dallas a few years ago when he said this, too often we judge other groups by their worst example while we judge ourselves by our best intentions. And if you could only see God and work among people that look like you and that think like you and act like you and vote like you, you're probably not worshiping God at all. You're probably worshiping yourself. Because the next time you meet a Cornelius, we need to be a Barnabas and lead with grace instead of judgment. But here's the hardest step. Because that means we need to look for ways to make a statement. Baseball historians know that Jackie Robinson broke down the color barrier in 1947. And it was not easy. Every ballpark he went to in his rookie year, he, including his very own in Brooklyn, he was jeered, he faced cat calls and racial epithets. But it was early on in the season, he, he had committed an error on the field, and the crowd was relentless. The name calling had started, the slurring had started, but then we saw something happen. All star shortstop Pete <coughs> Reese walked across the baseball diamond, put his arm around Jackie Robinson, and he stood there and he was silent until they were silent. Jackie Robinson says it was that arm that saved his career. 
He knew what he was doing. But Peter knew what he was doing. Barnabas knew what he was doing. They knew that they were making statements and the things couldn't be the same again. Reconciliation is limited by an unwillingness to advocate for somebody else. Sometimes it takes words. And sometimes it takes action. It almost always involves risk and sacrifice. But let me give you an example of what this looks like right out of the Bible. At the end of chapter 11, some prophets, including Agabus, say a famine's coming all over the Roman Empire. That's Antioch and Jerusalem. It's coming. But let's look at how the church responded. It said, so the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea. Did you catch the significance of that? Instead of saying, hey, we better hold on our money and, and wait to see if the famine's going to be real bad here. They think, no, it's going to be worse there. Brothers and sisters have lost their jobs. They've been kicked out of the synagogues. Widows have been taken off the roll because now they're named Yeshua as their Messiah. And they said, let's help them. It goes on to say that they gave as much as they could and they did this entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church of Jerusalem. They were making an intentional statement, and when that relief showed up, it did more to break down racial walls than thousand sermons could do. Because when we're right with God, we don't stop at, well, we're just do, not doing wrong to people anymore. We find ways to do right by them, especially when they've been wrong. And I know there's a lot of tension in our country around the flip phrase, Black Lives Matter. And I know I might get some flack for this statement, but I want to be very clear on something. We talked last week about Botham Jean and the trial of Amber Geiger. But right after the amazing display of grace by both Botham's brother and the judge who gave her, gave her his her very own Bible, Satan comes in and he refuses to let this issue go away because of the murder last week of Botham's neighbor Joshua Brown and the controversy that's starting to stir up all over again between black and blue lives. And I believe that we're being sold in this country a false narrative that you have to choose a team. You have to choose either black lives matter or blue lives matter. And I reject that. Amen. That's a lie. And I don't believe one word of it. I don't believe though that the answer either is that all lives matter. But here's why I say that. Your house is on fire. You call the fire department. And they say, come and take care of my house. And the fire department calls back and says, well, you know, all houses matter. Yeah, but my house needs attention. My house needs attention. And this is how Jesus operated in the world. He would specifically say and do things to make the point that children's lives matter in a world that said that they didn't. He would make a point to say that women's lives matter. That Samaritan lives matter. That lepers, their lives matter. And he didn't let his love for all lives stop him from specifically being a voice for those whose voice wasn't getting heard. And I heard the voices. After I asked those questions of those brothers and sisters, after I shared table time with them, these men and these women said, you have no idea what it means that a white man would want to stand up and have these conversations with us. And you know what? They're right. I have no idea. I don't have an idea, but I need to have an idea. And I need to be able to understand better. We all do. You know, Dr. King said, in the end, it's not the words of our enemies that we remember. It's the silence of our friends. And so I'm asking you as a follower of Jesus, where has God put you that you can leverage your influence, your platform, to dismantle injustice? Are you the popular kid at school? Maybe you can make a statement and go have lunch with one of the kids that needs more friends. Are you a person of color? Then maybe you can make a statement to your kids. Next time you go and you go to have dinner and you see that officer sitting across the table, walk over and pick up his check and pay for it. And say what a difference that makes. But maybe your skin looks like mine. I pray to God that if you pray to God, 
I promise he will open doors for you to leverage your influence, to make statements, and to speak for those who aren't getting heard. And I want to give you an example of what that looks like. We know him best as Mr. Rogers. Fred Rogers. You know, Fred was a, an ordained minister. I don't know if you knew that or not. But he hired a man by the name of Francis Clemens to be the very first African American. That's the proper use of that term. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. I had to. In 1969, he brought Officer Clemens. He was going to be the very first regularly appearing black man on a children's show. In 1969, Mr. Rogers went out to the sidewalk. It was a hot day. Can you tell he had his sweater on? There's a reason why he wore that sweater, and I'll tell you that story another time. He put his feet in a pool of cool water, and he asked Officer Clemens to come and put his feet in the pool. Officer Clemens, come and take off your shoes and put your feet in the pool with me. Officer Clemens couldn't believe it. He couldn't understand what he was hearing because he, he looked, he says, you're on national television, and you're saying you want me to put my black skin in the same pool that your white skin is in? But he did. He joined Mr. Rogers, and when they were through, Mr. Rogers took a towel and he dried off Officer Clemens' feet. And as the show wrapped up, Fred Rogers said what he always said, you make every day special just by being who you are. And I like you just the way you are. But that day, Fred Rogers didn't look at the camera. He looked at Francis Clemens when he said those words. And after the taping was over, he said, Fred, were you talking to me? Fred Rogers says, I've been talking to you for years. <laughs> but today you heard me. I just believe as disciples of Jesus, there could be so many opportunities for us to be heard if we have the courage to be heard. I want to live in a world where no one has to worry if you're unarmed and your hands are in the air that you're going to get shot. I want to live in a world where you don't have to wonder if the color of your skin is going to affect the quality of your education or can I get a job or can I get a home loan. I want to live in a world where if you have the courage to wear a badge, that you would be treated with respect and esteem. But I also want to live in a world that if you dishonor that badge, you're going to be held accountable. I want to live in that world. I want to live in a world where every single person created by God is treated with value and respect. That's white life. That's black life. That's brown life. That's refugee's life. That's immigrant life. That is unborn life. All lives. And I want my grandkids and my kids to inherit that world. I, I want my grandkids to tell their grandkids it's better than it used to be. And when their grandkids ask my grandkids, why is it better? They answer back and say, because the Christians started making a difference. And I think if Jesus spoke to the church right now, he would say just what Mandela said. Reconciliation starts here. Forgiveness starts here. And I think Jesus would look up and he would say, Would you bow your heads with me? So, Father, I pray that my words today have been true and that people have heard my heart and not just my words. I pray, Father, that, that you would give to all who hear this message a greater desire to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. For Jesus' sake, and in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Josiah, go ahead and switch that back for Nathan. This is a rugby ball. I picked it up this week because this is the 2019 World Cup event. The very same thing that happened back when Nelson Mandela took over and the World Cup that was actually hosted in uh, South Africa at that time. If you have not seen the story Invictus, I would personally recommend it because it's just heart-wrenching. You want it?
Hey, I'll get that back from you later. <laughs> Where's your heart? We've got a lot of work to do, people. But Jesus says, come to me, all who are here. And I will give you rest. Sometimes we need the rest. Sometimes we need the work that helps with the rest. If you're here this morning and you haven't named Jesus, if you haven't gone down into the watery graves of baptism to rise to walk in a new life, in that life that Jesus meant for you to live, today is your day of salvation. We're going to sing a song right now. We're going to sing a song that invites us to stand amazed in the presence of Jesus and wonder, how could he love me so much? Because he went to the cross and he said, this is what you talk about, Sam? I stand 